welcome to the Wellness Plus Podcast. I'm your host, Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Michelle Morris. She is the co-founder and CEO of Paleo FX. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. So you have an interesting background that you are actually a professional chef. Mm -hmm. And now you have had a pretty big dietary transition mm -hmm. to a paleo diet. So can you just tell us a little bit about the turn of events that kind of made this big change for you? Um, yeah, so my husband, Keith, um, who is the, uh, another co-founder of Paleo FX, um, decided quite some time ago, it's been probably close to maybe 16 years, um, back when it was dial up, when you, <laughs> we didn't have high speed internet, um, he was online just talking to, at the time, Rob Wolf and, um, who didn't have his book out yet, by the way, um, Rob Wolf and Art Devaney and talking to them online because he was um, uh, coaching um, a coach um, through, he, he's always done some type of coaching, some type of bodybuilding, that type of thing. He's mm -hmm. done that all of his life. And so he was working with a wrestling coach and was trying to find some dietary things that would help his wrestlers kind of get an edge. Yeah. And uh, Keith's always been very fascinated by nutrition and the ability to really change your body through what you're eating and how you how you train and that type of thing. So he was online talking to um, Rob and Art, and they were telling him about this paleo diet. And so, um, oddly enough, um, Keith thought, well, this is really interesting. But before he was going to pass it on to the, the uh, wrestling coach, he wanted to try it out for himself. Mm -hmm. So he started down the path of um, paleo. He said, oh, this all makes sense and everything. So he started it for himself. Um, he was probably paleo for the better part of a year before he finally convinced me to try it out. At the time, um, a chef, um, my specialty is Italian food, made my own pizza and pasta dough, that kind of thing. Um, and we believed that we ate healthy. Um, we didn't eat a lot of fast food. We didn't eat a lot of junk food. Mm -hmm. um, but what was happening was we did have a lot of refined carbohydrates in our diet, um, pasta, the pizza dough, even though it was homemade right. um, and from good quality ingredients, um, we were not eating healthy. Um, so when Keith um, decided to go ahead and try this out, what was interesting is that he has a hereditary form of high blood pressure. And... Um, the doctors were telling him, if we don't get this under control, we're going to have to put you on some type of medication and everything. Oh, he right. tried everything. He um, reduced salt. He all of the things. Right, right. He reduced his caffeine intake, stopped drinking any type of alcohol. Nothing changed it. And so um, when he started on paleo at the time, he was where he worked. They did a blood draw every 58 days. The, the, the blood bank would come and they'd do a blood drive. And so every 58 days he would give blood and the nurses would, before they do your, um, take your blood, they always check your blood pressure. Well, this, after he had been paleo, I think probably about three or four weeks at this point, um, he goes to give blood, they take his blood pressure and, they generally gave him a lecture before they would take his blood. Right. She starts to move on and he goes, wait, hold on just a minute. What was my blood pressure? And she says 120 over 80. And he goes, wow. can you check that again? Cause he thought there was something wrong. Right. And so she checks it again and she's really irritated. And she goes, <laughs> it's 120 over 80. And um, he's like, okay. So it's kind of anecdotal, but right. he's like, this is the first thing that he notices is, is a big change. Then he started really noticing that he um, came out of the food coma, the fog, where he was mm. constantly needing to eat. He had to eat uh, several times a day, every couple of hours. He would get real low blood sugar, would start getting the trembling, the wow. shaking, would get very um, hangry. <laughs> um, in fact, our kids used to tease him and say, Dad, are you low blood sugaring? Do you need something to eat? And yeah. anyway, we constantly carried around snacks with us mm -hmm. because he needed to eat so often. And so um, that was his first clue that this, this paleo diet was something for him. Yeah. So he started doing a lot of research and obviously talking to Rob, Rob celiac. Rob's talking to him about the celiac piece of it. And he keeps telling me, I really think every time, literally every time I ate, I had really bad stomach cramps and um, felt awful, was yeah. just very sick and um, 
constantly in a fog, felt very dazed, um, lethargic, not a lot of um, energy. I had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, um, fibromyalgia, and I had also been diagnosed with early onset rheumatoid arthritis. Oh my goodness, and how old were you around this time? Because you're young That's now, so 16, was... 16 years ago, so I was 36, wow. is that right? Wow, yeah. And that's so that's right. To have, to have so many different yes. um, diagnoses. It, it was a lot. And so um, he, he he's not one of those people that will beat you over the head with something. So mm -hmm. he would just mention it every once in a while whenever I would say, oh, man, I really don't feel good or whatever. He would say, I think you might have this celiac thing. You should get it checked out. Mm -hmm. And um, the other piece of that was that he stopped eating anything that I made that was not would not fall into a paleo diet. So he would start making his own dinner. So if I was making anything with pasta or pizza or anything like that, mm -hmm. he'd make his own food. And so he had been paleo, like I said, for about the better part of a year. And I was making, um, one of our kids was having a birthday or something. And so I'm, there I am, I'm making you know, pasta, I'm making all kinds of pizzas, oh, and yeah. he's over there making his own dinner. And I finally said to him, you're like never gonna have my pizza or pasta again, are you? And he said, no, and I really think that you have celiac and you should get it checked out. Wow. And I went, okay. So that was finally the, that finally did it for me to get to check it out. So I went and I actually got tested. And the um, endocrinologist that I went to, um, told him all of my symptoms and everything, and he really believed that I probably was celiac. Um, at the time that they tested, they didn't test for the right antibodies, mm. and so I um, um, I came up negative. And so he said, um, look, everything that you're saying sounds about right, so I'd like to do a biopsy on your colon and, and check for sure. And I was like, and while he's doing this, and this is one of the things, the side things that makes me laugh now, He's literally falling asleep while he's talking to me. I'm not even joking. Like he was nodding off in the middle of speaking to me. And it wasn't like he was listening to me. He was actually talking and he just kept falling asleep. And I wow. kept thinking, I don't want this dude cutting into my colon. But the other part of it too was I didn't understand why is the next step invasive? Why not just oh remove this from my diet, see how that works? So. I went home, talked to Keith, and I went paleo. And literally three weeks into paleo, everything was gone. Wow. Um, I had no um, symptoms of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, fibro, um, um, or irritable bowel syndrome, any of that. Wow. The other thing was when I went back into the doctor, there was no sign of RA at all, none, which meant I was misdiagnosed because mm -hmm. RA doesn't go away, it goes into remission. And so, um, so I was misdiagnosed and that's, I think for me, one of the telling signs of how bad chronic inflammation can be to your system, that it can mm -hmm. actually give you a false diagnosis of a very, um, difficult disease. Mm -hmm. So well, I just wonder how many other people have a rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis right. and maybe, you know, cause that's kind of like. Like you said, it's not something that you're going to one day recover from, whatever. This is like a condition that like now you just need to get used to this. Mm -hmm. But how many other people are out there who have been misdiagnosed? Right. And uh, this is the other piece of it. How many of them are on RA medication that shouldn't be? Yeah. That's that's the part that gets me. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I fortunately for me never went on any medication. Um I, I was on lots of other medication for migraines and that type of thing. So one of the things that, that happened too uh, first was that all of these were gone, all of these symptoms were gone. Then there was, a, I had not even recognized it. It had not actually registered that I had a problem, but I had a low back pain that I did, wasn't really cognizant of, but it was mm -hmm. there. So it was part of my normal life. And so right. it was something that we, we just start believing is normal. And that's mm -hmm. part of our, our life and and right. what have you and that was gone that was that was another thing that was like wow okay um then um what was really interesting is at the time you know women that are on the sad diet the standard american diet um tend to yo-yo 
when they decide to diet, they can they can drop low, whatever. And so you tend to have all kinds of sizes of clothes in your closet, which I did. I had everything from a size six to a size 12. And you don't even know or recognize when you're transitioning up and down that scale mm. um, of size. And so I was trending back down and didn't recognize it and just thought, this is normal. This is what, I, what happens. This is what I do. And so um, our son played select baseball and um, he had, they had been um, off season for probably 12 weeks or so. I had probably at this point been paleo for probably six or seven weeks, something like that. And uh, we had the first game of the season and um, showed up and all the parents hadn't seen me for you know, 12 weeks. Right. And um, they were just like, oh my God, you look amazing. You've like lost so much weight. You look so healthy. You look so, you know, so vibrant. What, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, I hadn't done anything. I was, I mean, I literally had not dieted because right. if I decided to diet, I would lose weight, mm -hmm. but I didn't even make that conscious decision. Right. I just was eating paleo. Right. And, uh, and it's funny. So, one of the things that that really got me was during the time that I was paleo, originally paleo before before all the p parents on the team saw me, I was pissed. I was angry that mm. I had to remove these foods from my diet in order to be healthy. And I was in a bit of denial because I kept believing, well, at some point I'll put these back into my diet. And I'll figure that out. It'll happen. I'll just be able to do it. Yeah. And so, um, so I was in total denial. And I, um, I was a food writer. I wrote for several um, websites and did a lot of recipe development and continued that even after I was paleo. Continued doing recipe development for websites that would be considered part of the sad diet. And so I, um, <laughs> oddly enough. When this day came where all the parents saw me and were like, oh my God, you look amazing. Mm -hmm. What have you done? And I registered that I had literally done nothing. I was just eating paleo. Right. And that's it kind of like calorie restriction. No. Or whatever. What people typically think of is weight starving loss. myself. That's pretty right. much what I did prior to that. And so when when that registered to me, I was like, oh my gosh, this is information that could help people. Wow. Keith always jokes that that was the day a paleo evangelist was born Aww. because at that point it was like, oh my God, this can actually make people, not only make people healthy, but you know, help them on that weight loss journey and everything. Yeah. So it was, it was crazy. So I immediately stopped writing for the other um, websites and started my own website at that wow. point. So. Well, that point. is just incredible that you know, I mean, I think there's so many people out there that, you know, have several different conditions mm -hmm. like that. And especially you see chronic pain and chronic fatigue often go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And those conditions are so common now. It's really interesting that just a simple change of the foods you were eating, mm -hmm. not a, like you said, not starving yourself, not restricting calories, not going on like mm -hmm. a diet, so to speak, mm -hmm. just just transitioning which foods you're eating suddenly all these problems get resolved yes. and you're and I totally know what you mean when a bunch of people see you and they're like wow you look great it's like this amazing feeling uh, yeah um, and you know I just wonder like now do you still have that intention that maybe one day you'll integrate those foods or now you're like this is a lifetime for me doing paleo no it's a, definitely a lifetime for me now um I I'm I will t I cheat every once in a while, I will have something I don't, because I'm not triggered anymore as much as I was back then, because I'm not continuing to constantly do, um, I, fortunately for me, I was at one point told that I was borderline celiac, um, by a doctor. Turns out that's not true. And you can't be borderline. You're either are, or you aren't. Mm -hmm. And so even in, um, you know, knowing, having as much knowledge as I had, being told that along the way um, has, was something that was really interesting. So I was told I was borderline celiac. Um, turns out I'm not. I have a gluten sensitivity and clearly it causes chronic inflammation for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I can have gluten and not die, um, but it will cause me all kinds of, of problems. Sometimes I choose um, depends on if it's something that's going on a big, you know, uh, celebration or something like that. I might have a little bit. 
Um, I try not to um, very often. And um, and the thing is, is that there are times where you're, it's going to happen accidentally. You're going to get glutened. Mm. And so I constantly carry gluten pills with me in that event. Um, but, but for the most part, I'm, no, I'm happy. I don't have any issues. What's interesting, so a lot of people will say, oh, I could never give up pasta. I could never give up pizza. I could never give up bread. And I would say to you, if I can do it, anybody can, because um, those were my three go-tos on everything with regard to, you know, comfort food with what uh, made me happy mm -hmm. or what I, you know, you, the foods that, that I um, identified with as, you know, um, just my social interactions with family and with yeah. celebration and all of that stuff, those totally are what I identified with. And now mm -hmm. I actually prefer the gluten-free counterparts, the zoodles, for instance. I yeah. prefer those over over um, having pasta anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they taste better. They're obviously a lot healthier for you and they don't give you that that food coma, that fog, that mm -hmm. just that also that feeling and of like having bloating. bloating. Right. And um, so I prefer them now. And um, yeah, it's not something that I'm I'm in denial about anymore, clearly. Right. Well, and I think it's so interesting because, you know, like on one hand, you have people who have basically just taken their diagnosis mm -hmm. or like, you know, your experience with the low back pain where like you weren't even really cognizant of it. Mm -hmm. But in your subconscious, it had just kind of been like, okay, well, now I have low back pain and mm -hmm. I'm going to live my life this way. You know, so many people have just accepted that their situation is unchanging. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe putting it like, all right, well, would you trade pasta and bread and all those things for feeling better? Yeah. For feeling better than you could have ever imagined that you would feel again? Um, interestingly, we had somebody on the podcast recently and they said, you know, among my uh, patients, people are more likely to give up cigarettes than give up sugar and refined carbohydrates. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because we think of nicotine as being so addictive. Mm. And she was like, I tell you what, nine out of 10 of my patients are like, oh, I'll give up cigarettes. Can I give up cigarettes instead of sugar? Um, and I just thought, wow, you know, not only are these foods like really bad for us mm -hmm. and now they're so highly processed that they're even worse for us than they may have been you know a hundred years ago mm -hmm. or you hear about people in Europe that can you know eat the bread and eat the flour and not have reactions um so it's just really interesting that I think the the addictive nature of those refined carbohydrates is probably more than anyone realizes um, and they just cause so much damage um, yeah, and I completely agree with you there. So that goes to show you, and you actually have a health professional telling you that the addiction for sugar and for refined carbohydrates mm -hmm. is so much higher than cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Totally believe that does not even phase me to, I mean, I definitely believe that. I, that is probably one of the biggest things that was hardest for me to um, get over. So I, I gave up the pizza and pasta. Mm -hmm. Mm, not not readily, but I did it, and I of course didn't die or anything, and I you know I didn't get in a you know big huge depression over it. I was pissed, but I was I was not. You think that these are going to be painful painful things, and mm -hmm. that in reality, the definitely the trade off is so much better. Right. But the thing that took me the longest was to get rid of the sugar. It took me a long time and that was not overnight. Right. It was probably a good six months. So I was, I should say, I was mostly paleo for those, but I was still drinking Dr. Pepper and what have you. I still had sugar in my coffee. Mm -hmm. What I did do was switch to what I was doing. So it did help me lose the weight and it did help me feel better pretty immediately was I switched um, the sugar in my coffee for, um, originally the first thing I switched to was raw sugar. Mm -hmm. Then I switched when I found out that there was coconut sugar and this was a long time ago. This was oh, like right. the very, very, very beginning. Coconut sugar was like not prevalent. and mm -hmm. But I found out that there was this thing called coconut sugar and that it actually had some n nutrient value. Mm -hmm. And so I started using the coconut sugar instead of sugar in my coffee. Now I was weaning down. But it took me a, quite a while, and I switched from having um, uh, 
sodas to I I switched over. That, it's about the same time that I also went. Um, I decaffeinated. I stopped drinking okay. caffeine. Found out that it was one of the triggers for my migraines and everything. So I, um, which actually, I'll get back to that in a minute because there's an interesting aside to that. But so I was um, doing decaffeinated the or the caffeine free Coke at mm -hmm. the time because there was not anything else that had caffeine free that that it was appealing to me. I didn't right. really care for Sprite or Seven Up, and so um, so switched to that. And then um, I. Um, when I found that there were, that I could do like my own kind of like make my own simple syrup with the coconut sugar. Mm -hmm. And, and so then I started switching to soda water with that and then weaned that down to nothing so that now I drink, I love like soda water with nothing, just a little squeeze of lime or lemon yeah. in it. And, and, um, but it took a long time. It took a good six months to get mm -hmm. to that. Um, it took six months to get me where I was not, I don't do any sugar whatsoever in my coffee anymore. Um, so really, really super crazy about that. Um, yeah. that whole thing. And it's the addictive nature of what those are. And the thing is, is that the Food manufacturers know this. Right. They know that um, they, they use our DNA against us. I mean, that's just what they do. And so when they marry um, really uh, good marketing with the fact that they manipulate and they manufacture foods to use our own DNA and our wiring against us, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to overcome. Yeah. And honestly, that was a big piece of like me being able to get off sodas is like I just really started seeing these companies as predatory mm -hmm. you know I was like okay so these people are engineering a product that not only isn't good for you mm -hmm. but it's like really really terrible for you on all these different accounts and then they actually have food scientists you mm -hmm. know the people that make the processed foods and all that they're not called chefs Right. They're, called cooks. they're called food scientists and right. that alone was or like, engineers yeah, was, yeah that alone was like kind of a little light mm -hmm. bulb going off that like man they're like engineering these foods mm -hmm. to keep us overeating to keep us feeling hungry and to like perpetuate not only that like physical addiction but like the emotional addiction to mm -hmm. sugar which i think starts at a really really young age yes um and just you know when i started like really kind of seeing that for what it was I mean, like why well, I don't want to give my money to these companies that would mm -hmm. like basically rather see us all be sick mm -hmm. than do something that might affect their bottom line right um that was a big piece for me and like being able to like all right I'm gonna give these up like you said transitioning to sparkling water and things like mm -hmm. that because uh, it is interesting when you start changing your diet you start um kind of becoming aware of the different like emotional attachments you have to food mm -hmm. and when you're stressed or you're upset or whatever, it'll be like one thing that you always gravitate towards. Right. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what is, you know, what is the paleo diet, um, you know, guidelines, what's allowed, what's not allowed, so to speak? Um, yeah, I can talk about that. So um, my, our, we run along paleo and primal. Okay. And so the difference between paleo and primal is that paleo, no dairy primal dairy if your body can tolerate it and there's a lot of people that cannot to tolerate dairy mm -hmm. um but there's a caveat to that there's a lot of people that believe that they are lactose intolerant which is not actually correct what's happening to a lot of people actually a good majority of people as far as dairy is concerned is that they probably if they have any issue it's not necessarily the lactose it's the casein but mm. the other part of that the other piece of that is it's also the processing so right. we suddenly decided in the name of shelf life that we wanted to start ultra patch pasteurizing our our dairy mm -hmm. not only that then we also homogenized it the and then so what these two things do is they destroy all the good bacteria that is in dairy mm. and then we fortify it by putting in synthetic vitamins which your body does not recognize and that that typically is what people believe is lactose intolerance it's really the intolerance to synthetic vitamins that have been added back to that um that dairy so there's that piece mm. there are people that are lactose intolerant right. and casein intolerant but a lot of times when what we find is that if they move to raw dairy which is very difficult in right. a lot of states to get 
um, in the state of Texas. It is legal, except that you have to go to the farm to get it. You can't just go into the store and buy it. Right. Um, there are low heat pasteurization and um, you can get it um, non-homogenized, which is great in the stores. The problem is you still have the pasteurization. And, right. um, but generally, um, as a rule, those are those are great alternatives. And what we find is that a lot of people that try that tend to not have a problem. Right. Um, so getting back to paleo and primal. So both of them though, although primal allows dairy and paleo does not, um, both of them are removing all processed foods, all added sugars, all grains, legumes, soy. And then there's some, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I don't know, controversy, that's probably not the right word, but a lot of, of um, discussion and um, debate over whether or not um, starches are safe. And so personally, I, I believe that's a N equals one. Every person's got to do their own research and figure out if, if starches work for you. Because on a lot of levels, um, they can be very beneficial particularly um, if you do a lot of working out, those can be very helpful right. to a person that works out because they actually need the carbs. Um, finding the right ones is what's really the key, is finding right. out, are you a person that can tolerate rice, for instance? I cannot. Um, my blood sugar gets, my insulin is totally shot to hell if I have rice. I, I don't recover well from it, so I don't eat rice. Um, my alternative is cauliflower rice and that type of thing, or other types of rice, um, and ricing other vegetables and that type of thing. Um, potatoes, sweet right. potatoes, those are all things that you need to test and see. So I do well on red potatoes, which are the new little new potatoes, mm -hmm. or the fingerling potatoes, or the purple potatoes. Don't do okay on sweet potatoes, which is weird. So you would think that I would do fine, but I get an insulin um, shot from eating those and don't recover. So, um, but that's basically it is really just eating whole foods, whole real foods. Mm -hmm. And when you eat whole real foods, you shop the outer um, perimeter of a grocery store. If you're at a grocery store, it's better to go to a farmer's market and know who your um, food comes from if you can. Mm -hmm. But shopping that outer limit and only going down the aisles when you need paper products or whatever, or, right. you know, some types of supplies. Um, and you know, the thing is, is that I would also go further as far as what I believe paleo and primal are. And that is not just removing the toxins from your foods, but removing the toxins from your life. Mm -hmm. And that is removing toxins that in the way that you clean your house, yeah. because there's a lot of toxins in the cleaning chemicals that we use in mm -hmm. our in our homes. Then there is the toxins that we put on our bodies every day, which is, you know, um, soaps and shampoos and conditioners. And then for ladies, we put on makeup. Mm -hmm. And um, they say on average that the average woman puts 86 toxic chemicals on her body and face wow. per day. 86. And so that, and the thing is, is that at the end of the day, we have so much stuff going on in the, the environment. Um, we have so much pollution and that type of thing. Um, our food supply is not what it was before. Um, we, back when our grandparents were coming up, they had a good food supply. They, right. their foods were nutrient dense. Ours are not. Mm -hmm. We have soil depletion because we're monocropping. Um, we have a lot of toxic runoff. And then of course, you take into account that we have lots of pesticides that we put on our foods and we have inhibitors that either inhibit growth uh, or bugs or some type of thing like that, but also that are, um, we add a lot of chemicals and hormones to animals. Mm -hmm. And um, so in our opinion, the um, what we call a confined animal feeding operation is what factory farming is mm -hmm. and we believe that that should be completely abolished it is something that is not good for our planet it's not good for us um but at the end of the day um you know it's there's just so many things that yeah. are going on and we just have to really be careful about 
you know, the toxins that we have because mm -hmm. we're getting to lots of people have a lot of toxic overload on their bodies and their bodies can't overcome it. We're um, in a day and age too where like I particularly do not have my gallbladder anymore. If I would have known back then what I know now, mm -hmm. I would never have let them take my gallbladder. Yeah. We have all of our, we have all of our organs for a reason mm -hmm. and just removing one because there's an issue is a little bit, in my opinion, very, um, what's the word? Um, it's not just ridiculous. Insane. It's kind of, in, in my opinion, it's, it's, um, I can't think of the word. I'm anyway, um, medieval in a way we re we remove, uh, these organs instead of fixing the problem that's causing the issue. And the thing is, is that lots of these things, I could have fixed the problem. If I had been given dietary advice to change what I was eating, I would have been able to fix that problem on its own. Your body is miraculous. Mm -hmm. It is an amazing and lack of a better word machine. It's not a machine, but it is this amazing thing and yeah. it has the ability to heal itself of all kinds of things, cancer included, if it's given proper nutrition, if it's given all the proper things that it needs to fuel itself, right. it can overcome. And this is the thing, a lot of people don't realize this, but almost every day you have cancer in your body. Mm -hmm. Almost every single day you have cancer in your body of some kind. And every day your body fights and gets rid of it. Mm -hmm. Your body's capable of that. Right. The thing is, is that it, there comes a point where the toxic overload is too much for your body to continue to fight it. And that's why we ultimately end up with disease. We end up with cancer, heart disease, obesity, um, diabetes, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, all of these things are huge contributors because of the fact that we end up with this toxic overload from the foods that we eat. So right. that's why I take that further and say it's, it's removing all toxins because all the load ends up ultimately causing a problem. So you could be, this is the thing. I, um, I've been paleo for a long time. I just battled skin cancer last year. Wow. And so, um, the thing is, is that my body was able to naturally overcome it. I didn't have surgery. I didn't do chemo. I did not do radiation, which by the way, cracks me up because the initial dermatology office that I went to, I'll, it will remain nameless right now. Um, was very irritated with me because I would not rush to surgery. I told him, hold on, give me five minutes to mm -hmm. figure out what this is mm -hmm. and what I can do about it. I'm not ready for you to just take cut me, me cut, cut me open and, and start giving me chemo and doing all of that stuff. And so, and I'm sorry, not chemo, radiation. And um, so I, they fired me as a patient because I refused to dis go in and do surgery. I chose a natural path. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that I was cleared of skin cancer in three months because I chose this natural path and I chose to do the things that my body needed it to do instead of choosing to have them cut into me. And so, um, the thing is, is that we, we, I think that a lot of times we allow the medical establishment to scare the shit out of us to do what they want us to do because at the end of the day, obviously money, but at the end of the day too, they aren't about, they're about sick care, not about health care. They're not about mm -hmm. prevention. They're about maintaining and managing disease. That's what the system that we have is. And the thing is, is that that system was initially set up. We needed it because at the time that it was set up, we had communicable diseases and they needed to be taken care of. And, and what happened is of course, pharmaceuticals came in. And so now we take a pill for everything. We take a pill because we have, you know, we are depressed or because we um, have impotence or we, whatever the case may be, we, right. we've got depression. We have all of these things. So every, there's a pill for everything, it right. seems like. And so the problem is, is that we're very, very quick to go ahead and say, pop the pill. And this is, I'm not, I'm not preaching at anybody. I'm just this, I'm with you, yeah. uh, which was a piece that I said, oh, and this is an aside that I want to tell you about a little bit later is that one of my triggers for migraines was caffeine. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go off caffeine, what have you. Well, I was on medications for a long time, since I was 17. From, since I was 17 until 2016, I came off all medications. Wow. 
What's interesting about that is that my medications, I took a daily medication for, for migraine pre prevention. Then I took another medication that if a migraine was coming on to try to stave it off. Mm. And then I took another medication. Actually, I took two dailies now that I say that. I'm sorry. Two daily medications, then the middle medication to try to stave one off, and then a full-blown triptan if, um, and I had a prescription for three different triptans because you're only allowed so many triptans per month, and so I would have to switch because my migraines were coming so fast and oh so hard and gosh. so often. And so, um, and you couldn't take two triptans within two days of each other because then you could end up with serotonin s syndrome. So wow. I had all this medication that I was taking, and um, turns out, after I came off of all the medications, and I also did um, cranial Botox treatments for, for migraines that seemed to help a little bit, but they, didn't, they weren't the end all be all. I kind of got control of my migraines once I went paleo, but I still had them because I was still on medication. But as soon as I finally let go of that medication, all my migraines have stopped. It's because it's perpetuating the this, this situation. It's wow. perpetuating and putting you into this loop of, um, you know, a lot of people you hear about rebound headaches mm -hmm. from particularly acetaminophen, over-the-counter drugs, that type of thing. You hear about rebound headaches. Well, if those can do it, why in the world wouldn't these highly, highly right. toxic and highly potent drugs do that? Well, they d absolutely did. So everything that I was on was perpetuating the situation that I was in. And I figured out caffeine's not really the trigger. Caffeine with those medications was the trigger because now I can do caffeine and I'm totally fine. Wow. It never causes a headache for me anymore. So migraine since age 17? Since 17. Oh, God, bless you. And I'm 52 now. But uh, I've been um, migraine-free um, for two years now. Mm -hmm. So all of that, that's, that's the system we have. Yeah. Um, and so everything is about... What pill can we give you to try to take care of this? The problem is, is that the pills never end because mm -hmm. you end up, that pill ends up causing something else that you end up. So you end up in this cascade where they said that the average person in the United States is on 24 medications. Average. Wow. And I bet you 99, maybe not that, a large percentage of those people don't even know five of them. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many people... Because um, I do like health coaching and stuff, and I'll ask them, okay, so what medications are you on? I'm like, uh, well, I'm I have to go get them. Um, yeah, well, I'm on one for my heart, and you know, and I'm just like, well, so not only do you not know the name of it, but clearly you haven't gone and like done some research on it to see. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's just so many different things, like the contraindications for drugs. There's mm -hmm. like too many medications for any of those doctors to actually keep track of all the contraindications. Don't take this drug with this one, whatever. Exactly. Um, you know, somebody recommended recently, you know, if you're on a bunch of medications and you're having strange health issues and you don't know what's going on, don't ask your doctor, ask the pharmacist. So yeah. The pharmacist knows way more about the drugs than Oh, the no doubt. Does. No doubt. Well, and this is the thing. Um, doctors, if they're lucky, get six weeks of pharmacy um, pharmaceutical training mm -hmm. while they're in school. Now, six, we're talking six weeks out of a 12 to 18 year education, wow. six weeks. And then that's what they do. So it's interesting because this doctor, actually I was on a panel with him not, this, not, not that long ago, and he said, we are trained for a five minute solution. Well, what do you think you're getting in five minutes? It's going to come off of a notepad and they're going to sign it at the end and you're going to take it to a pharmacy. That's your solution. And the problem is that's not a solution at all. Right. That's a Band-Aid. And it's a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. Yeah, it's a Band-Aid that makes everything else yeah. worse and doesn't resolve the original problem that you came to that doctor with. Right. Um, man, that is just, you know, unfortunately such a common situation for people mm -hmm. to be in. Um, and it's certainly not that all pharmaceuticals are bad. I no. mean, there are so many instances where those are life-saving mm -hmm. medications. It's just gotten so, um, just kind of so rampant mm -hmm. and so much that like people expect to get them at, you know, a uh, prescription when they see the doctor or the doctor just feels like they're expected to give the person a prescription. Mm -hmm. 
um, it really, and so it's just kind of this compounding of all of the different problems. Well, and when you also see that we're the only country that allows pharmaceutical companies to actually advertise directly to consumers, mm -hmm. which is unbelievable. It is right. really unconscionable. Because at the end of the day, you're taking away the opportunity for this person to actually get well because at, we all want the quick fix. Right. And so when we see a commercial that says, you know, which, by the way, everybody seems to ignore all the disclaimers at the end that like oh, end in death and all of these things right. that come with a lot of these pharmaceuticals is they just all they hear is the quick fix. Oh, this is going to fix my problems. This is going to fix my problems. No, it's going to mask your problems. And guess what? more than likely nine times out of 10 going to make your problems worse. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it's really unconscionable that our country allows pharmaceutical companies to do direct consumer advertising. It's mm -hmm. it, like I said, it's not, n n there's no other countries that do allow that. So, you know, what, what else are we to expect is going to happen? And the thing is, is that at the end of the day, the whole system that was set up, like I said before, was, it was set up to um, try to get rid of the communicable diseases. Well, we did. And now this system is broken and doesn't work for what we have now. We have what we call diseases of modernity or diseases of, well, I sh it's interesting. I was just at Ancestral Health Symposium and they kept saying it's not really diseases of modernity. What's happening is there's just this explosion of these diseases that are now they're they're the the modern problem is what they are so cancer obesity diabetes alzheimer's heart disease all of these things are all on the rise and in our children which is even m more disappointing and more upsetting but it's it's really interesting we the system that we have isn't set up to fix that it's set up to to maintain it and mm -hmm. to just perpetuate it right well, it's so funny, uh, type 2 diabetes, they originally were going to call adult onset diabetes. Well, right. they couldn't call it that because they started noticing that children right. were developing diabetes. And so that's why it's called type 2. Right. It was just kind of an interesting, um, you know, perspective. And it really begs the question, you know, how much is nature? How much is nurture? Mm -hmm. You know, never throughout history have you seen the pure volumes of people with all of these different conditions mm -hmm. and multiple conditions. Right. When you start talking to people, a lot of times they've received multiple diagnoses of a lot of different things. Um, and so I wonder, you know, in your situation, so much was resolved by changing the diet. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a lot of those problems, the chronic fatigue, the chronic pain, the migraines were maybe caused by the diet in the first place? Oh, yeah. I, I would imagine the, the my entire diet was horrible from the time I was 17. Um, the other thing is, I think that the, the, the initial perpetuation of the migraines was the fact that I was put on the pill. Mm. So I'm also introducing a synthetic hormone into my body and my body's trying to figure out what the hell are you doing and what and the thing is is that at the end of the day I'm so glad when I actually finally did get off of that medication I got off that medication after just um I think I had only been on the medication for a couple of years um but it in, ended up inducing what they call a cyclical migraines which is um or um um, sorry, I'm trying to think of the word here right now, um, uh, menstrual um, migraines, which, so I had those in addition. And then of course, you know, you, you put that all together with, you know, I'm a, I'm a teenager, I pro I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping right, mm -hmm. because, you know, we stay up all night long right. and do whatever. And then, if, you know, all of the other things that you add to that. And so um, it's just really, the whole thing is really interesting how the whole system is set up. Right. Um, we, we put girls on, on um, preventative, um, you know, contraceptives that are just so toxic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's just not even funny. Um, I'm, I, I really wished I would have known then what I know now because I would have never allowed that. And that, that would have pro probably been a big piece of it for me. Yeah. But I kn I've learned that now. Mm -hmm. Well, it is interesting. I mean, 
just taking, and as you were kind of mentioning a, a second ago, I mean, there's all these different pieces. We can mm -hmm. talk about the food processing, all these different pieces, the factory farming, which is mm -hmm. huge. Um, I know that a big component is like if you just look at the hormones, mm -hmm. okay, how many things are we introducing to our system that disrupt our endocrine system mm -hmm. or prevent our body from being able to balance the hormones? Which right. is like our mood, our sexual health, you know, everything you know, you can start looking at like, okay, how many of the body systems rely on hormones? Mm -hmm. Well, almost every one. Yeah. Um, and so you can think about the hormones they give to the cows that make the milk, mm -hmm. the hormones they give to the animals that become our food, mm -hmm. you know, not to mention the different endocrine disrupting chemicals from the plastics and the fragrances. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just start, you know, for me, my big like aha moment was in college. Um, kind of learning about cancer and apoptosis and mm -hmm. how our body's always stopping cancerous cells mm -hmm. from happening. It's not like you just randomly, a cell becomes cancerous one day. Right. It's like every single day, right. these these potential cancerous cells are being, um, you know, killed mm -hmm. by our body to keep us safe. Well, I started looking at all of this and you see all the different little pieces and you start to really get a big picture of how you know, just like an overall assault mm -hmm. our bodies are under. Um, and thinking about like the, the all the toxins and everything, I kind of think about it like an air filter. Mm -hmm. Like you can have a really clear visual image of, you know, what happens to an air filter when it just gets too full? Right. Well, things just stop moving through it. And I think so many people are under such a big toxic load from mm -hmm. all these different things. It's not any one piece, right? but all the different pieces coming together that our bodies are just like a big clogged up air filter. Mm -hmm. And now you have toxins building up and then our fat cells are like little storage units yep. for toxins. So when you look at all of the weight issues, I mean, toxicity and weight gain to me are like very much the same thing. But it's just really interesting, um, you know, how much of a big, like profiteering game our food and medical industries have become um, so much to the detriment of you know the people <laughs> not to mention the environment the animals mm -hmm. it's just such a broad spectrum um, oh, yeah. thing well it's interesting that you bring that up because um, the thing that I find interesting is that we have like you said so many hormones so many things in our um, foods and everything that's where I don't know, there's a, people have started to really take notice that particularly young girls, mm -hmm. you start seeing young girls, younger and younger, mm -hmm. starting to have breasts, starting to have menstruation. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not normal. That's because of the introduction of all the hormones into our food system. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that it's really difficult to get around any of that and free, like, we have endocrine disruptors in everything. Mm -hmm. Like the thing is, is that soy is one of the largest endocrine disruptors in the in, in this country. Soy is in everything. Mm -hmm. Like you can't. It's it's really difficult to avoid it. And the thing is, is that's actually that's actually something I'm allergic to, which is interesting to me that it took me a long time to figure out that I was having problems because of the amount of soy that was in mm -hmm. the thing. And you. I don't know. No, boy, don't. Uh, we're just like going down a rabbit hole that I'm going <laughs> to. I'm one of those people that just gets so upset about the fact that we have the system that we have, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, between soy, between uh, all of the things. The thing is, is soy is cheap. Right. It's a really cheap thing to put into our products and everything. And um, and we're one of the only countries that allows what we do. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the things that we allow into our food system, they're not allowed in other countries. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one of those people that's all tinfoil hat-ish and conspiracy theory, but at the end of the day, a friend of mine said, you cannot control a healthy and independent thinking citizenry, mm -hmm. but you can control one that's dependent and sick. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is where we're headed, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and it frustrates me because, like I said before, the system that we had for the medical system was something we needed back when when 
they first developed me the medical school. Mm -hmm. We needed it. We don't need it anymore. We need a complete overhaul. And our doctors need to learn to practice health care prevention, mm -hmm. not sick care. And we just are not set up for that system. And uh, you brought up um, type 2 diabetes, that they initially wanted to call it adult onset. And the thing is, is that, yes, that's a, you can see that direct correlation from lifestyle to disease. Mm -hmm. You can see that correlation, particularly when it comes to diabetes. What a lot of people don't know is that they call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. Wow. So Alzheimer's can be completely prevented. prevented. Mm. It's just what are you doing to prevent it? So I'm a big proponent of everybody knowing what your DNA is. I have had my DNA done by 23andMe. Um, unfortunately, 23andMe no longer does the full scale thing that they did a few years ago like I had done. And I recently found out that I'm APOE 3-4. Well, for people to understand what that is, um, so there's APOE 3-4 and APOE 4-4. Both of those are the alleles for Alzheimer's. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's complications at the age of 93. Mm -hmm. She had Alzheimer's for a good, probably 16 years. Oh. Um, and so this is the thing. Now that I know that, for most people, and this is something that I'm going to actually be talking about a lot at Paleo FX this next year and bringing in some, some people to, because I think particularly because I've been paleo, I've been keto, I've done all of that. I've done high saturated fat. Well, for people that are APOE 3-4 or 4-4, that is actually not helpful for us. So I have to watch my saturated fat intake. Um, so I can't have coconut oil on a normal, regular basis. I can't have butter like everybody else. I can't have bacon fat. Um, I also have another allele that's called GAD1 that has a problem with glutamate. So I have to really watch what I eat as far as meats and stuff are concerned because of the glutamine content, because it's excitatory to the brain. And mm -hmm. so oddly enough, I've been paleo and keto for all this time. And here I am, I'm, and I've been relatively healthy, but I started noticing that I had some issues and um, I ended up with a um, severe mold exposure that caused all kinds of hormonal problems. So there's a lot of things in the environment that can cause real big issues, right. and it's caused a huge fluctuation in my hormones in the last couple of years. Well, finding out that I'm APOE 3-4 helps me mm -hmm. to know that, okay, my paleo diet has to be a modified paleo diet. I need to be a little bit more Mediterranean. Olive oil, avocado oil, mm -hmm. avocados, lots of, lots of those yeah. is good for me but watching the rest of it. So it's a, I think that's probably one of the most key things besides having your blood um, drawn and having your hormones tested and having, you know, having a standard for what is your, and, I, and I'm preaching this a lot, mostly to young women, because I wish I would have, again, wish I had that, you know, hindsight is 2020, but mm -hmm. knowing back in the day when I was actually relatively healthy, that I could have had blood markers set up for now that I could mm -hmm. be showing to doctors and saying, hey, this is what I look like when I was healthy. This is what my blood looked like when I was healthy. Yeah. I don't have those benchmarks. I wished I, that I did. Now my blood is tested every quarter. I have my blood tested every single quarter to see where I'm at with hormones, particularly because of menopausal and all of that. But the thing is, is that if I didn't know those things, if I didn't know my um, DNA, I could still be doing detrimental damage to myself mm -hmm. thinking I'm eating healthy. Right. And the thing is, is that that's part of, of, I think that we're very fortunate that we have the ability to take a look at our DNA and mm -hmm. know. It was, that's the other part of it too, is I don't think people need to stress over their DNA. What they need to do is understand it, that they're all switches. Your DNA is just a switch, and it's a matter of whether you turn that switch on or you turn that switch off. And right now, I need to make sure I don't turn those switches on because mm -hmm. I am at high risk for getting Alzheimer's. And so doing everything that I can to make sure that I stay as healthy as long as possible is the last thing I want to do is be a burden to my family, my husband or my children, mm -hmm. and because I have Alzheimer's when I could have prevented it. 
I could have done things to change it and I didn't. And the thing is, is that I'm doing all of that now. And I think that it behooves all of us to find out what are the things in our, what are those switches that we need to make sure don't get turned on and do the work because it's work, it's not easy, but do the work to make sure that you don't become a burden to somebody else. This is the thing is that we don't think anything of that. Mm -hmm. We don't think of the fact that we, at, at the end of the day, we believe we've gotten this in our heads that we are uh, this, the, the road to death is a slow decline and that your body just starts deteriorating and that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. And that's bullshit. At the end of the day, our, the way we're supposed to live is we're supposed to live until the moment we die. We are not supposed to go into the slow decline into um, deterioration. It's not mm -hmm. supposed to be that way. And we've accepted that lie. And that is a lie perpetuated by Big Pharma. It's a lie perpetuated by our medical establishment. Mm -hmm. That's not the way we were intended to go. Right. And so uh, I'm doing as much as I can in my part in educating people to understand that your health is actually not just your right, but your responsibility to take control of. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be your own health advocate because doctors don't have the ability to be your health advocate. Right. Not that they wish you harm, they don't. By and large, you know, the majority of doctors out there, are, they got into becoming a doctor because they wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, most of them end up not doing that. Most of them end up making people very sick or perpetuating and keeping them in their illness instead yeah. of freeing them from that. And you can be freed from it. There's no reason to be a slave to it. Mm -hmm. It's just, you have to take responsibility. You have to be the one that does the work. And the thing is, is that sometimes it's not easy. I have fought doctors. Uh, I fought my doctor for three months over my, um, I have hypothyroid. And it was induced by the severe mold damage. The yeah. severe mold, I mean, the severe mold exposure caused hormonal damage to me that ended up um, causing a problem with my thyroid. Mm -hmm. And I was arguing with him for three months over it. And he kept checking my, and this is the thing too, is that I would have loved to have had my, this is why I, I say over and over, get your blood drawn, get your, get your blood work, know what your blood work is. And the thing is, is that if I had had my blood work from back in the day when I was healthy, I could have showed it to him and showed him the difference mm -hmm. and said, this is when I'm healthy. This is what my thyroid looks like when I'm healthy, because that's the other piece of this is that the numbers that they use to determine whether or not you're sick or you're healthy are numbers based on people who are very sick, not on people who are healthy. Mm -hmm. So when they say average, who wants to be average? Like, I don't want to be average. I want my health optimized. I don't want to just settle for being average. So when he comes in and he says, oh, your numbers are average. No, that's not. And we're all individual. That's right. the other piece of this is we're individuals. So what your TSH should look like for you that's normal for you may not be normal for me. I may need a higher T TSH. I may need a very much lower TSH. Mm -hmm. It's just totally dependent on the individual. And that's the problem is that we're moving in that direction to where we're doing customized um, uh, medical. And, and what we're gonna start seeing is, is customized healthcare. And mm -hmm. we're starting to see it happen because doctors are starting to catch on that, oh crap, this person is completely different than this person and the numbers, they don't match. Well, I was subclinical. My numbers didn't, they didn't look like I was, but I had every symptom that there was and I knew without a doubt I had it. And there was a nodule on my thyroid. That's the dead giveaway. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have a nodule on your thyroid if you don't have a thyroid problem. Well, um, finally, after three months, my TSH started screaming and he was like, oh yeah, you're right. I'm like, well, if you'd listen to me three months ago, I was telling you, you need to look at symptoms. You need to look at the person. You need to look at this person. How are they feeling? Mm -hmm. What is it that they're, I mean, do they have no energy? Do they have, is their hair falling out? Do they have thinning eyebrows? All of these things that were happening to me, weight gain that was unexplained and that I couldn't get rid of. I mean, all, right. everything across the board, hitting a wall at three o'clock in the afternoon, feeling like sometimes I couldn't even get out of bed. And so he wasn't, he just kept treating 
the numbers instead of treating the person. And that's something you have to fight for when you are um, a patient. And, and it's not easy, but it's worth it when you finally, I feel amazing now. I finally got all of the stuff that I needed and I'm, I feel amazing. Well, I'm just so thankful that at least now there is a big shift. Mm -hmm. um, certainly here in Austin, there are a lot of, you know, doctors and professionals kind of taking that more holistic approach to actually mm -hmm. look at the person, get an idea of not just what they're experiencing now, but what are the major life events or traumas they went through. Um, and it's just really interesting how, um, you know, people that have kind of accepted mm -hmm. their diagnosis or accepted their condition of health or whatever. Um, it's like, you don't even necessarily think, you know, oh, I'd really like to feel better. You know, mm -hmm. people just accept that that's where they're at and like there's nothing they can do. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, you know, now more than ever, there are more resources for people to uh, kind of get that inside look. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it's just such an amazing thing. We can see our blood, see our genetics. It's amazing how much insight you can gain just mm -hmm. from knowing what's going on in your body. Um, and now we have more access to healthy foods mm -hmm. than we've ever had before, more access to information. Um, and it's interesting, even just looking on uh, like YouTube as one example. Mm -hmm. You know, YouTube started as this uh, like alternative to the mainstream media. People can come out, it's free speech, you can say whatever you want. And over the last couple of years, there's been this big move of censorship. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically like they have chosen what they like and the information that they like, and if you have information they don't like, they're mm -hmm. cutting your income. We can see it even on our views, you know? Mm -hmm. So what's going on in their algorithm mm -hmm. that like our videos about natural health, about nutrition, you know, aren't getting views. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've kind of asked this question, well, you know, who is YouTube beholden to? Mm -hmm. Their content creators mm -hmm. or their advertisers? And unfortunately, those advertisers are big pharma, big food, all of those things that unfortunately big pockets. are yeah, big pockets. Our health and wellness channel mm -hmm. is kind of trying to, uh, you know, offer natural alternatives for. So, of course, they don't like us. Right. If you've got political views that they don't like, I mm -hmm. mean, there's just so many content creators that have been virtually silenced. Um, so, it is really. Um, up to the consumer, up to the person, for us to, you know, look outside of the mainstream, because you're not going to find this information on a major television network. Right. And unfortunately, even on YouTube, unless you really know how to go and look for it now, like, even their YouTube algorithm mm -hmm. is shifting towards just the information they want people to see. Right. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, you know, people start feeling you know, overwhelmed and it's like, oh, then there's just nothing that I can do. Uh, but from my perspective, I really see it as like, hey, now there's there's more we can do than ever. Yeah. We have all of these different resources. We can learn about our bodies, learn about food um, and different dietary approaches. Um, you know, I think it'd be fun to do another podcast on like paleo recipes and cooking. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can mm -hmm. shine a little light, you know, because, you know, I just try to help people see it not as limitations of all these things. Right. Like, let's look for, um, you know, where's the springboard that mm -hmm. we can move into really taking care of ourselves and helping our bodies do what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. which is be healthy, be energized. Um, and there's, unfortunately, in this modern age where everyone's, like you're saying, instant gratification, uh, everyone's just busy all the time and rushing around and it's like, well, you're making time for all of these other things, mm -hmm. but why do we make time for ourselves? Well, you know, that's the thing too, is that we, um, we take better car care of our cars than we do ourselves. Yeah. We put more into our cars than we do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate because this is the only vehicle you're getting. Mm -hmm. It's it. You don't get so to trade it in you don't year. get to trade it in and get a new one. You uh, this is the one you get, but we don't take care of it because we don't see it like that at all. Mm -hmm. We don't see our health as an investment. We see it as a cost. Yeah. And your health is definitely an investment. And at the end of the day, if you don't invest in your health, trust me, you're going to be really sorry down the road mm -hmm. because 
at, then it's going to re that's when it's going to become a cost and you no longer can invest. Right. It's like you're missing out on the shot to invest in it right now. Mm -hmm. So you either invest in it, you're going to pay now or you're going to pay later. Mm -hmm. You're not getting out of it. So figure out which one is more important to you. Right. And, you know, I, I want to go back to something you said a little while ago. You were talking about all of these different things, these different stressors on our bodies. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is so interesting to me because all of these things that we start creating disease from is all ends up being stressors. It's environmental, it's toxic, it's whatever it, the case may be. And the other part of that is, is that we were, we're, we're meant to be these species that we can become superhuman in a, just a, at the flip of a switch because that's the way we evolved to become. So if you suddenly had a predator after you, you were, you're a caveman and you suddenly have, you know, T-Rex bearing down on you. You suddenly became superhuman because your system kicked into gear and gave you what we call the flight or fight response. Mm -hmm. And that's either you're going to be able to stay and fight. You're not going to fight the T-Rex. You're going to run. So the, that's the flight. And the thing is, is that unfortunately our bodies in, are now in a constant state of flight or flight. And the problem is, is that we weren't made to be in a constant right. state of it. It was supposed to be this boost occasionally when needed, when there was something that was we were in danger. It was a way for your body to be able to help you get yourself out of that danger mm -hmm. and for uh, the species to survive. And so the problem is now we're constantly in that state mm -hmm. because of all the stressors and all the mental stressors that we put on ourselves of having, you know, that big corporate job and keeping that corporate job and not sleeping and working all night and being under, you know, artificial light and constantly in this state state of stress mm -hmm. all the time we're constantly in a state of stress so our adrenals are shot to hell that's that's begins that piece then like you said we have doctors can't don't ask for all what what traumatic things have you gone through or what have you what have you been through because at the end of the day all disease ultimately stems from trauma that we mm -hmm. store in our body mm -hmm. and so we don't have Animals have this way of releasing trauma. They throw themselves on the ground, they shake, they do whatever you see. Um, this is something that's been really interesting to me lately. My dogs, I love when I pet them that every time I pet them, they shake. And I was like, why is that? So I went and I checked it out. And it's because you've excited them too much. They need to shake that off. Oh, wow. And so I, that's an interesting, so then I get really disappointed if I've, sh I've, I've rubbed them and then they don't shake. And so I'm like, <laughs> oh, I didn't excite you. So the thing is, is that we don't have any way to release that. Mm -hmm. We don't release it. So we hold it in our body and then ultimately down the road because we don't take care of our body. We don't, we don't exercise properly. We don't sleep properly. We don't feed ourselves properly. We eat junk. We do all of these things. We high stress jobs. We're constantly, it ends up that that trauma ends up ultimately becoming disease. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's another thing is that we we need to seek alternative forms of therapies that are not traditional. And the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, Eastern medicine has been doing this for centuries. And mm -hmm. there's people that have been surviving and thriving because of the fact that they have these um, therapies and modalities that they use. Right. Um, so one of the things like doing um, chiropractic, acupuncture, massage, EMDR therapies. Now I, I am a big fan of infrared and I mm -hmm. do a sauna almost every single night. And that's r helping release the toxins that are caught up in my body and that you can't, it's just very difficult. It's particularly when you're so busy to do the things that you need to do. So we just need to do, we need to take care of ourselves because like I said, this is the only vehicle you get here. Mm -hmm. So why are you taking care of your, you know, little Ford Mustang, but you aren't taking care of this? Mm -hmm. Cause this is a Ferrari. Right. I mean, it's amazing machine. It's a Ferrari. It, it does everything for you mm -hmm. if you're good to it, right. if you take care of it. It is so true, you know, another, and I use that car analogy a lot, too, because mm -hmm. I think it's something that everyone's like, oh, of course I get my oil changed on schedule. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's just kind of that thing. 
Um, same thing with, uh, you know, going to a mechanic. Usually people will like shop around, you get different quotes, you're looking for a mechanic that you really trust. And interestingly, the relationship with doctors mm -hmm. is like completely upside down. You know, like you take it and whatever they say as just like, that's how it is. There's no getting a second opinion or whatever. Um, and so it's just, it's very interesting kind of the um, authority that has been created for those And doctors. this is the thing. We usually allow our insurance company to dictate who our doctor is. Yeah. We don't usually choose our doctor ourselves. Mm -hmm. We choose, we'll go on and go, oh, well, this one's close to me. I'll go to this one. Yeah. And we don't actually shop for who actually fits us. Mm -hmm. Like I, my, the doctor I was using, I no longer use. I liked him at the beginning um, when I first started using him, but when I realized that I was gonna have to fight him on everything that I needed, mm -hmm. became a problem for me. And I ended up choosing a functional medicine doctor that I don't have to do that with, that he's my partner. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is that we need to see doctors as our partners in that we can come in and we educate ourselves and we know what's happening in this in this vehicle and we can go in and go okay well she's breaking down she's not running properly this is what i'm seeing and this is what's happening and these are the things that you know i'm i'm feeling and mm -hmm. that's the other thing is we don't trust ourselves and our bodies anymore we don't listen to our yeah. bodies and your body has its own diagnosis system it can tell you when it's having an issue and by the time it tells you that it's having an issue, that issue is pretty far gone. Mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't be waiting. So when we initially first start feeling, oh, you know, I'm kind of having a like this little tweak in my, my right knee, what's that? Go get it checked out immediately because that is an indicator. That's a diagnosis. That's That would be no different than your light coming on on your dash saying, I need to be serviced. Right. It's the same thing. But the problem is, is again, we keep seeing this, at the, our health as a cost and not as the investment that it is. Mm -hmm. And like I said, some point it stops being able to be an investment and it's going to become a cost and it's going to be one of the two. You're not getting out of it. Right. It's one way or the other. So choose which way you want to go and i would say this way c continues to allow you to be a free person mm -hmm. to have quality of life to not be tied down to for one thing you see healthcare costs are doing nothing but skyrocketing and they there's no way around that considering the system that we're working with and the fact that we don't have a healthcare system we have a sick care system and you know obamacare as much as it tried to do what it was to, to try to get insurance coverage for everyone, that's really not gonna work at the end of the day either. So, and we don't even still know what that whole system is gonna be. Even the people that wrote the law don't know what it's gonna be. So it, my thought process is try to not be part of that system because we don't know what it's ultimately gonna end up being. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I don't know, that's, that's my whole thing is you're gonna pay one way or the other, just figure out which way you wanna go. Do you wanna, try to keep yourself out of that system? Do you want to try to keep yourself healthy and free and have quality of life and not be on 24 different medications and worrying whether or not the medications are contraindicated for each other and all of that? I mean, yeah, that's it's just, just so much. So, so kind of in closing here, um, can you maybe just talk about like what you would consider to be like the the pillars of living your optimal health. So clearly getting the toxins out of your diet, mm -hmm. finding a way of eating that works best for your body. You know, mm -hmm. I love that you keep kind of emphasizing that you don't just like fit every peg in the same hole. Mm -hmm. You learn about your body, maybe it's blood testing or genetic testing to help you learn mm -hmm. what foods you do well on, what foods you're sensitive to. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, chiropractic, massage, acupuncture. Um, what are the other other pieces for people to help live their optimal health? Well, this is the thing too. I, I also believe that um, there are many pillars to health. So you have obviously your physical health mm -hmm. and you have your mental health. And I think those can be tied together quite a bit. Yeah. So you have your physical, you have your mental, you have your emotional health. Again, tie those three, three things together. Then you have your relational health. Then you have your financial health. Mm. And then you have your spiritual health. And the thing is, is that you, I'm not one of those people. So I'm a Christian. Um, I'm non-denominational Christian, but I'm a very open Christian. There are a lot of people that, um, 
that are like, well, if you're a Christian, you're just Christian and that's just the way it is. And I just don't believe that. I, I believe that, I believe that's my path. Mm -hmm. I believe that's what works for me. I believe it can work for a whole lot of people. But I think, I, I'm gonna say this in the words of the Dalai Lama, get on the horse and ride. And whatever that horse is for you, if it's, if it's Christianity, if it's Buddhism, if it's Taoism, if it's whatever it is, get on your horse and ride it. And don't, don't, I just don't worry about what, my, the thing is, is that there are people that will be gravitating towards Christianity because whatever they see in me, they're like, oh, I would like to have that or whatever that might be. And then there are people that are like, no, I don't have any belief in anything. But I think at the end of the day, we all believe in something, mm -hmm. even if it, we think it's nothing. Right. So even if you think that there's no God, you still have a belief. Mm -hmm. I don't highly recommend that one, but I, I believe that, I just believe there's, um, I think there's something a lot bigger than all of us. And I, and I think having a tie to that is, is really important. So I work in plant medicine quite a bit and I have done a lot of work over the last three years and it's completely changed my life and changed uh, probably the trajectory of my life mm -hmm. because I've been able to, for me, tap into that divine source and really get connection that that tells me, okay, you're not on the right path. This this is your path, and you need to head this direction. Mm -hmm. And 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 I believe that you need to find whatever that is for yourself, and that nobody can tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. That you have to you have to be the one that tells you. I think definitely that just recognizing that like our physical and emotional health mm -hmm. are so intertwined mm -hmm. and interestingly enough, you know, our culture definitely like treats those very separately mm -hmm. in the medical industry. They're treated by completely separate doctors, mm -hmm. um, but it's just very interesting how, you know, when people do take those steps to improve their physical health, almost always they notice that improved emotional and energy and mental feelings and positivity um, and same way the other way around. Mm -hmm. People start um, meditating or mm -hmm. or seeing seeing a therapist, just talking about your, your emotions and your mm -hmm. feelings. And I think there's so much to that whole, you know, uh, like don't bottle up mm -hmm. thing. And we're definitely in a culture of like bottling stuff up. Mm -hmm. And even though everyone's really like social media connected, we don't really Connect. communicate with people and we don't talk about our emotions and our feelings and the things we go through. And I think that like emotional bottling up like kind of manifests in all these different physical issues too. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you would kind of mention that, that spiritual piece mm -hmm. is just kind of, you know, hey, everything is, is interconnected mm -hmm. in your emotional well-being. And just, you know, I think in general people... You know, we feel overwhelmed. We feel like there's just too much, whatever. So it's like, what can you do that helps you just kind of feel like you're taking the reins a mm -hmm. little bit and you have some kind of something that grounds you or mm -hmm. that you can come back to when, when life does get hard mm -hmm. and, you know, things get thrown at us that are difficult to deal with. So it's like, how do you handle that and not just bottle it up and let it, you know, turn into some kind of physical issue later? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> there's so many pieces of that that I'm just like, I, I, which one do I jump on? Uh, because um, I, I, you know, we constantly have this debate over, like you were talking a little bit earlier about nature over nurture. And the thing is, is that they both matter. Mm -hmm. Genetics and epigenetics matter. They both do. Mm -hmm. There's not one, it's not one over the other. They both matter. And um, the thing is, is at the end of the day, we are so socially connected through m social media and all of that, but we're not connecting, mm -hmm. which is a big difference. Mm -hmm. And we're not having relationships like we were intended to be. We're a tribal people. Mm -hmm. We need community. We need people. And that's, that's another thing that's not healthy anymore right. is that we're, and the thing is, is that it's not like, oh, get rid of the technology. That's not what I mean. I think technology has its place. It's no different than, you know, thing is, is like, I'm also not one of those people that's like, oh, 
screw all of Western medicine and pharmaceuticals. Obviously, at the end of the day, pharmaceuticals have had a place. And and, um, and I also would not, you know, Keith always says this, I wouldn't want to break my leg in another country. I would want to break it here. Right. And I would, you know, we have shamans that we work with for our emotional and spiritual health and everything. But they're not who we would see if we broke a leg, right. we're going to go see a Western doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to go see a chiropractor for a broken leg. I'm going to go and have it set and done all that. So there's a place for all of these things. Mm -hmm. It's what's the perspective? What's the proper place for that? And I think once you start realizing that technology is great, but it needs to be put in perspective mm -hmm. and it needs to be used in a way that is healthy for you and not harmful. And the thing is, is that we tend to, particularly as Americans, take everything to the extreme. Yeah. And so instead of doing something like that, we need to kind of step back. Um, uh, my friend Dallas Hartwig is um, uh, less media, more social. Mm -hmm. And I, I like totally, that. yeah, less media, more social. I totally agree with that because we end up tending to have these relationships through, you know, Facebook and what have you. And and don't get me wrong, I think that some of that has been really great because you get people connected through through that media that may not have found each other or whatever. Because, I mean, you think about it, we can actually, we could right this minute talk to people over in another country and then be part of this. That's amazing. That's incredible technology. Yeah. But at the expense of what? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, turns out that a lot of social media and everything is at the expense of our emotional and our mental and our spiritual health. Mm -hmm. And I think just in general, you know, you can talk about like, yeah, the social health and all of that thing. Then you consider like the, you know, uh, EMF radiation that's coming mm -hmm. out of all these technological devices. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, it, it's not just your phone or just your computer. Like, you've got a gaming device and a TV and a this and a phone and a tablet. And it's so much. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of back to that idea of, like, a clogged up filter. Yeah. You know, like, if it was just coming from one thing for part of the day, then, like, your body would probably be able to deal with it. You mm -hmm. know, we're incredibly resilient. We can deal with so much. Um, but when you start just recognizing that it's, like 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi, the, I mean, you can start mm -hmm. listing things off um, and then drawing in that factor that everyone's different. So some people's bodies are, are not going to be negatively affected by those things or not affected in a uh, apparent way. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's other people whose bodies are just not going to be able to tolerate it at all. Right. Um, and it's very interesting how, you know, we look at all this information and, and people feel overwhelmed and they feel confused and it's like oh I'm just gonna go get a pizza instead this is just like too much and for me I really see it as like the knowledge is power thing mm -hmm. like you know about this do something simple like turning your Wi-Fi router off at night when you mm -hmm. sleep was a recommendation that somebody gave recently um, putting your phone on airplane mode when you go to sleep you know mm -hmm. All of these technological devices, I think it's it's important that we just recognize, in addition to the social effects that we're getting from spending more time online and less time in social interactions with people, mm -hmm. that these devices are like not healthy for us in general anyways. Yeah. Um, and most of us are, I think, either in a room filled with computers and cell phones all day long if you're in a big office or something and we just need to start recognizing that these mm -hmm. things do have an impact on us mm -hmm. but at the same time there's really simple things we can do mm -hmm. um getting outside more working from home sometimes turning off your electronic devices at night um, but that's just kind of one little piece that i think also you could see you know that same thing with the food you know talking about uh the manufacturing of food and extending the shelf life, I mean, mm -hmm. that's an incredible technology. Mm -hmm. You know, what they've been able to do to food, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's come with this really big cost. Mm -hmm. So now we just need to back up and be like, all right, well, maybe those, you know, canned foods and processed foods, that's great. Keep your, uh, you know, wherever you're going to be that you need those non-perishable foods handy because they're going to potentially save your life one day, but it's not necessarily something that you need to be eating every single day. Right. Like, go ahead and eat some vegetables, eat some real foods. Mm -hmm. The fact that they perish is yeah. what makes them good for you. Right. So it's just kind of 
um, finding the balance, I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, like you were saying, we're, we're a culture that tends to go all the way mm -hmm. with something. So it's not that all of these things are just terrible, but we just need to find that healthy balance for ourselves mm -hmm. um, that we're taking advantage of the different benefits they offer, but we're not letting them make us sick. Yeah. Which unfortunately, from the foods and the technology and the stress and all these different things, mm -hmm. um, they're just having a really big weight on people. Agreed. I mean, like one of the things you said earlier, um, the severe mold exposure, it did affect Keith a little bit, but not like it affected me. Mm. So that's just the individuality of, right. of a person's um, system and what's happening. And then the thing is, is that he, you know, stress affects him very differently than it affects me. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to be mindful and really tap into your body's knowledge on what it needs and, mm -hmm. and how it needs things to be. Because at the end of the day, like I said, this is the one vehicle you've got. And right. it's an amazing one. You know, how are you going to treat it? Definitely. Well, Michelle, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the program today. Um, and I really look forward to exploring some of these other topics with you. Uh, maybe giving some yummy paleo recipes to our <laughs> listeners. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Definitely. I want to thank all of you for tuning in to the Wellness Plus podcast. I hope that you will join us over on wellnessplus.tv where you can see the video versions of this podcast. And of course, you can visit paleofx.com mm -hmm. to learn more about Michelle and her incredible, incredible paleo event. Definitely want to delve into this topic more with you. So yes, thank you all for listening. And I look forward to having you on the program again soon.